Good morning. Tommy, my friend, and I drove from Huntsville, Alabama this morning to come, and we did not need to turn the radio on for music. We just listened to those warnings on the cell phones, that emergency, beep, beep, beep. It's very interesting. I'm telling you, we had these lakes that would be on either side of the highway, just coming up to the edge of the highway, and a great temptation to stop and fish, you know, because they're just big bodies of water. For those of you who are listening on a recording right now, why, we've had a monsoon for the last few days, and so water around like I haven't seen before in these parts, and that was pretty interesting coming over this morning. I'm so glad to see you here. We have a really a large crowd. Uh, I wondered how that would be with the weather, and I'm so thankful for you that you've come to be part of this today. The way this is divided out, we're going to be talking about service and different categories, different relevant parts of this. And my first lesson has to do with our hearts. And here's where I want to go with this. When you go to Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you can read discussions of the seven churches of ancient Asia, with which you're familiar. And what you have is Jesus, in essence, giving a report card for each of these congregations. It's a magnificent tool for us today to say, how do, how do we match up? Suppose the Lord was examining East Hill or West Huntsville or West Fetville or whatever congregation. And what would he say about the congregation? What would he point out that was good and, and the things that we needed to work on? It's a wonderful tool to be able to use. Now, if you sit down and you read the two chapters, it's not hard to, to figure out that there are three major issues that the seven churches had problems with. You can find floating to the surface three major categories of problems, doctrine, sexuality, and heart. And because our discussion today is about the heart, I want to, I want to bring to your attention three of the congregations and the specifics of the heart problems which they had. Now, we're, we're going to do this because we, we need to learn from this. That's the reason why the Holy Spirit made sure that we have it. So you have Jesus doing the examination of these three congregations, Ephesus, Sardis, and Laodicea. And, and then he gave it to John, and John gave it to the angel or messenger of the congregations, and then it was read to the churches. And now, here we are a couple of thousand years removed, and it's being read and discussed today. Now, I, I want to give you just this introduction, and it's, I don't know that it's pertinent to our hearts, but just to make this observation about the seven churches that I think is fascinating. I'm going to make a lesson, a speech in a few months, Lord willing, uh, in, in the power lectures in South Haven, uh, Mississippi. And the subject I have for that lesson is, is uh, something to do with Christianity in a politically correct atmosphere. Political correctness is a is a fascinating thing and a curse on our culture. And one of the things about political correctness is that, and really I think it came from hell, frankly. I think, now, you know, people who are Christians always knew how to not be rude or insensitive. We're always, we're about being, you know, Ephesians 4 and 32, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. That's the nature of Christianity. We all understand that. But what we're talking about in political correctness is a horse of a different color. You know, that's uh, because, the, because people get to create the rules. And suddenly what it translates to is that we're not able to say things that are true because that could be offensive to someone. But, and I'm not going to spend my lesson this morning talking about this. I just want to introduce the, the concept, the idea of the seven churches with reference to this subject. What you have is, is Jesus giving a report or a critique of these seven churches, but he does so in a rather generalizing way. Don't you think that's interesting? He doesn't get, get caught up in the weeds going through all the individuals in those congregations and the different spiritual levels that they have. This is kind of a comprehensive thing to say, let me tell you about this congregation as a whole. And that's not something so unique in the scriptures. For example, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 12, you know, you, you hear about the Cretes the Crete, people of Crete and the Cretans, one of them, a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, which thing he says is true. What do you got there? Well, you've got a, a rather remarkable generalization of that whole culture. Isn't that interesting? 
You have the same thing in, in the words of my Lord in, in reference to particular occupations. I'm thinking about publicans. Reckon there were any publicans that, that had better qualities and some had worse qualities, some who were more or less righteous. Isn't it interesting that, that our Lord in Matthew 5, 46, if you love those which love you, what thank have you, King James says. Don't even the publicans do that? In other words, everybody knows the publicans aren't much good. Everybody knows that the publicans have the reputation that they have, dishonesty and all of those kinds of things. And, and if you want to, to make an illustration, you can contrast different kinds of people with publicans because everybody knows how the publicans are. I just think it's interesting that, that while the New Testament teaches kindness and generosity and benevolence and all of those, those wonderful qualities, you still have these, this, this kind of teaching as in Revelation 2 and 3, that's rather broad in its scope. And the reason why you have to do that is because if you don't generalize in reference to massive cultural trends, then, then you're going to get caught in the weeds and you'll never accomplish the teaching that you need to do. All right, that's going to be a discussion for another day. That's what's happening in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. There are three churches I want to reference this morning in this session as pertains to the subject of the heart. They had heart trouble. Now, the first one is the church at Ephesus. And I'm going to read in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Revelation 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You've persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now, now listen, Christianity is an intellectual religion, isn't it? He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You take somebody who says, my religion is really emotional in its base. Somebody given over to emotionalism and you'd say, now, wait a minute, that's not good enough. It has to be intellectual. You have to believe first and be baptized. You've got to believe first, right? But this is sort of flipped over in this example. This is an impressive church. He says, you can't bear those who are evil. That, that means that in this congregation, those who would impenitently practice, we know, we know that all people in, the, in Christianity, we all sin, we know that. But, but the difference is that sometimes a person will leave the ranks of faithfulness in the sense that he's impenitent. He, he, he's, not regret, he's not regretting his sin. He's living in his sin. And though urged to repent, he won't repent. You take 1 Corinthians chapter 5, for example, a man living with his father's wife and living in adultery. And the problem is he's not, he's not interested in changing. And so the church here at Ephesus, you know, it says, uh, you, you, you can't bear those that are evil. To bear means to sustain or to uphold or support. You know what? That's a great quality. I mean, it sounds a whole lot to me like 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 2. And Paul says, to those people, you know, they've got adultery going on in the congregation and they're not addressing it. They're, they're not doing anything about it. They can tolerate the evil, right? And Paul says, you're puffed up and you haven't rather mourned that he who has done this evil among you might be taken away from among you. For indeed, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, what Paul was teaching was what the people at Ephesus were doing. They couldn't bear those that were evil. I tell you what, I, and I didn't come to talk about the practice of church discipline today, but, but you need to hear me say this. We need to be saying this. If we aren't practicing the withdrawal of ourselves 
in the way that the New Testament teaches in our congregations, we haven't fully restored New Testament Christianity. Now that ought to scare you. It ought to scare you because we're, we're very determined about restoring in other things, and so we should be. But the omission of this is because I suppose on some level we've decided that the church actually belongs to us, but it doesn't. Well, I know if the church belonged to you, if you were the one who died for it and you owned it, I suppose you could figure out how you wanted it to be governed. But you want to know how to behave yourself in the house of God? You go to that New Testament. That's not something that we just salt and pepper our sermons with. That's the, that's the final answer. You hear what I'm saying? And, and they were doing that in Ephesus. They were, they were practicing the, the, the discipline of, of their members the way the New Testament teaches, so far as I know. He's, he's bragging on them about that. They had that courage to stand for what was right in reference to that. But the heart was the problem. You've left your first love. What do you make of that except that they had the intellect right, and in reference to standing for right, they were doing that, but there was something missing. It's a matter, it's a matter of the heart. You can't have a faithful Christian life void of, of intellect, can you? I suppose some people are trying to do that, but you'll never be successful. But I, I'm telling you that this passage is teaching that you'll never have successful Christianity void of emotion either. What about your heart? And Paul's been teaching this all along to the Ephesians. Now think about the book of Ephesus, uh, or of Ephesians, written to the Ephesian Christians at Ephesus, and think about how that he emphasizes the heart in every chapter. Here's Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What does it mean? It means that blessings which are of the spiritual nature, the blessings which, which have to do with heaven. Yeah, is that emotional to you? I, I mean, when, when we talk about the answer to your prayer, that's a spiritual blessing. God, God blesses even the atheists with physical blessings. Matthew 5 and 44, 45, God causes his rain to fall on the evil of the good. That's happening today. What about spiritual blessings? Well, there's a difference. And a spiritual blessing is of spiritual concerns, the forgiveness of sins. What, what does that do to your heart when I reference the forgiveness of your sins? When you talk about the blood that washes away, you, you have any sins you need to have forgiven? How many sins has he forgiven you for in your lifetime? And what does that do to your heart right now when I reference that? What about Ephesians 2 and verse 8? For by grace, you're familiar with this, for by grace you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. What does that do to you? I'm saved today in Christ by His grace. And my response to that grace is my faith. Mm, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. My faith is my response. And James 2 and 26 says, faith without works is dead. What about chapter 3 and verse 11? I love this one. May be able to comprehend, Greek word katalambano, and it means to take hold of with one's mind. May be able to comprehend what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. I'm telling you, the love of Christ is all those things. Just measure it out the breadth of it. There is no human on the planet that his blood won't forgive. Talk about the breadth. I'm telling you, that's impressive. What about the depth? You say, I just don't, I don't think he could forgive me. My sin is too grievous. No, no, it'll reach down. It'll reach down all the way. If you'll come to him, I'm telling you, he'll forgive you. What about the height? The height why, we're talking about heaven and the length. You ever dream about eternity? You ever try to wrap your mind around an eternity? That we're going to live forever and ever and ever. And that, I tell you, for Christians is the ultimate reality. I'm going to heaven. And it's because of his love. And he wants us to comprehend that. Now, what does that do to your heart? I mean, there's an emotion wrapped into Christianity that, that we can't do without. To the Ephesians, he said, you know, you, you're getting the doctrine right, but, 
but you've left your first love. The passion was missing. What about chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 1? I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. It means you call yourselves Christians, you ought to act like Christians. With all lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, look around you. Let me tell you something. These are your people. You know, truth is thicker than blood. And some of you have family, and they're not Christians. And you, you love them because you're biologically, you're, you're tied by blood. You have the same genes. But you want to know who your real people are? Look around you. You're part of the family of God. This is, this is, the, this is your family you're going to live with from now on. I mean, from now on. And we long for heaven. And, and, and about these people, he says, I want you to be long-suffering to them and gentle and forbearing one another in love. You know what that means? That means to put up with each other. And, and, and sometimes that's a challenge. And what we're doing is endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, when you get to chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, you know, you're familiar with this. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody. Where? In your hearts. To the Lord. How are you doing on that? I mean, I mean, worship, really good worship is hard work. Is that a true statement? I think it may be. Brother Mosier, I, I wonder if worship on the Lord's Day isn't more challenging from, for the preacher than anybody else. Because you, I don't know, you probably, now Brother Mosier is a brilliant man, and he, I have to work at it, not like him. But, but, you know, you sit on that pew and you're about to get up to preach and your mind's full of that sermon. You're, that's what you're thinking about. But what I've got to do is to focus on that song and the words, the sentiment of that song and, and worship him from my heart. How are you doing on that? How are you doing on the prayers? When you're in worship, are you focused on that? Now, the people at Ephesus, he says, you, you're doing some things really good but you've left your first love. Now, now, before I leave that, I want to emphasize that it's probable that they loved something. I, I don't mean this suggests that they were void of love. I, it's just that they, they weren't loving this. The heart was missing from, from their worship and from their Christianity and from their practice, and it wasn't good enough. It's not going to be good enough. Well, I suppose... I suppose they had jobs and businesses, and I guess they had family matters and friends and perhaps social, th I don't know. They had lives like they have lives like you have and I have, and so many things that we can get wrapped up in. It's kind of like the parable of the soils in Luke chapter 8, and, and the thorns, you know, and the seeds grew up with, that's how my gardens always go. You have the good stuff, and it grab, grows up with the weeds, and the weeds just choke it out. And you can have a lot of things in your life that are not sinful in and of themselves, but it just gets so wrapped up around you that you don't have time and don't have mind. Do you ever sit in worship and your mind goes to business matters or social matters or other kinds of things? And, and we're in danger when that sort of thing is happening. We're in danger of falling into the pit with the Ephesians. You've left your first love. All right, let's go to the next church. Now we're in chapter 3 of Revelation and verse 6. Let's talk about the heart problem in Sardis. To the angel of the church at Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you've received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I'll come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels." He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Sardis has a heart problem. They have a name that lives, but they're dead. They, they had reputation and reality confused. Now, he doesn't give the kind of compliment to them that he gave to Ephesus, and the conclusion is more severe. You are, you are dead. 
I would assume that, that they rather liked the, the reputation. You know, you think about a congregation cares about what other people and congregations think of them and would like for them to think that it's an alive, good church. That's a very faithful church. But it wasn't reality. It was mere perception. It wasn't reality. It was reputation. And Jesus isn't fooled by that. And Jesus says, I, I know the truth. You're dead. Now, it's interesting in the Scripture that you have occasions where this word dead is used for people who are up and, are, and living and, and alive. It's something on the inside, not on the outside. What, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6, she which lives in pleasure, are you ready? Is dead while she lives. Or, or Luke chapter 15, when the prodigal came back, his father said, this my son was dead and he's alive again. And to the church here at Sardis, same thing. Christians can be dead metaphorically. And this is very serious because church members here, verse 1, were spiritually dead. Verse 3, they needed to repent. Verse 4, because they've defiled their garments. And then he says, if you don't, I'll erase your name from the book of God's book of life. What do you, what do you suppose would be characteristic of a, of a dead church? You reckon we ought to talk about this? What, do you, what kinds of things would be characteristic of a church that still has a, had a reputation of being alive, but Jesus would say, it's dead? It's similar to, to Sardis, you know, you've left your first love. Uh, Ephesians, Ephes, you've left your first love. What about here? A name that lives, but you're dead. I think a dead church would be one which had start, stopped dreaming about ways to reach the lost. We turn inward. We, we're just not about saving the lost. We're not, we're not thinking about that. We're not focusing on that. What kinds of new approaches can we use to bring the gospel to the world so that they will be able to hear it? A death to real hunger for the Word of God, not attentive to sermons much anymore. I mean, I listen and I maybe I, I'm really interested to see if the preacher will come up with some pithy statement that'll amuse me or some interesting anecdote. Maybe that would be, but so far as Actually focusing on that and applying the principles he's preaching to my life, maybe not so much. Death to holding one another accountable. I've always believed that in a healthy church, the greatest part of church discipline had nothing to do with the elders. That's what I think right now. I, I, I'm a, an advocate of what the New Testament teaches about the withdrawal of fellowship and about church discipline to its fullest and all of that as we've been talking about. But I don't believe... That, that most church discipline ought to have anything to do with elders. It has to do with Christians talking among themselves. Now, I'm planning to come to the gospel meeting every night this week. Now, can I, can I sit with you every night? Will you be here? You know, it's, you know what that is? That's church discipline right there. Or two teenagers talking, and one of them says, I'm going to go see this movie. And the other one's saying, I don't think we should go see that. That's got trash in it. I don't know, and I don't think we should do that. Or one member saying, one teenage boy saying to another teenage boy, and they're on the same football team, and one of them says, did I see you with a beer bottle last night? What do you think you're doing? Do, do you think that's right? That's not right. You've got to stop that. What about your influence? Nobody's going to believe you're a Christian if you drink. What just happened? Church discipline just happened. Had nothing to do with the elders. I'm going to tell you, a church that's dead is one where people quit doing that sort of thing. They, they just don't talk like that. They don't talk like that. It's, it's a church where you have a death in the eldership inside of them, where the eldership is not made up of men who, who are what I call kitchen table elders. They, they degenerate down to being boardroom eldership. Now, I understand that elders have to meet and have to make decisions. I, I, of course that's true. But, but that's not shepherding in itself. In itself. You've got to have more. You've got to have a, a shepherding dynamic where we go and we see people and we talk to them about their souls and, and what is it that we can help to make this better, to make you better, to grow as a Christian and to dream with Christians, to put your arm around a young man and say, you know what, I think that you could make a great gospel preacher and if you'd like to pursue it, we're going to help you do that. Hmm? To say, now, I believe you're ready to teach a Bible class. Or to say, look, I've got an idea about something, a job in this church that we really need, and I think you're the person to do this. Or to say, let's talk about your family, and how can I help you with this? And you, you get the idea. 
You get good elders that cocoon into an office and they're not involved. They're not really involved in the lives of the people. You're looking at a dying or a dead church. You suppose there are dead churches today? I'm not trying to depre depress anybody. I'm just trying to emphasize what Jesus is talking about in this church, this discussion of the church at Sardis. Was there a time in your life when you worshiped more faithfully? When you prayed more deeply? I understand that it's Saturday morning and we've had a deluge and you're, you've come to this. I expect we have, and I mean this sincerely, we have the cream of the crop in this room and I'm just so honored to be talking with you. But I can talk to you like this because we love the Lord and we love his word. Was there a time in your life when you prayed more deeply? A time when you evangelized with more dedication? A time when you worked harder at being a Christian husband or a wife or a parent? A time in your personal history when singing was a joy and the Lord's Supper sometimes brought a tear? When prayer, your private prayer, escorted you to the very throne of heaven and you knew he was listening? and where a visitor was warmly welcomed by everybody. You might be spiritually dead if you rush through the Lord's Supper. I regret the fact that in some of our congregations, we, we've done that. We, we, I don't know why we did it. We just weren't thinking. But we made it so, let's just minimize it. Let's do it small. Let's do it quick. Let's get it over with. I know that we wouldn't say that. Of course we wouldn't say that. But maybe we've done it. You know what you ought to do, elders? You ought to, you ought to tell the guys that serve the Lord's Supper now, now we want you to give us an extra 45 seconds after you get done at the back of the building distributing the emblems. We want you to just stay put and give us a little more time to meditate on the, on the cross and our Savior. You might be dead if you sing in a nonchalant way or not at all in worship. You know what? You look, if you're standing up here, and I'm, I'm not a song leader, but you stand up here and you can look around the crowd and you're apt to see people who just don't sing. Maybe they just don't feel like that they're any good at it and so they just don't do it. And I'll tell you, God will never be pleased with that. Now, if your vocal cords have been removed, I suppose that's different. But for those of us who, who could sing and we just choose not to, what's the matter? What's the matter with that? God won't accept it. Do you frequently offer God memorized prayers? Are you impatient about the time spent in worship? Maybe I, I had an elder say to me, not here, but somewhere else. He said, Glenn, that was a short sermon. I loved it. <laughs> if you're a deacon, but you don't care much about the excellence of the work that you're doing, you might be dead. They had a name that lived. And I expect they probably were glad about that. But we're not in the court of human opinion. And, and what he's emphasizing here, and what I want to emphasize to us, is that we need to have a heart that's involved in this. Is your heart involved in it? I mean, is it from your heart? One more thing about that. It's interesting to me to consider that the things which we perceive as blessings in our lives, in reality, I think for, for Sardis, probably made them just more comfortable in their lost state. Now, one more. Laodicea. Here's Revelation 3, verse 15. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. It's a heart matter. To him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. I am rich. Now, material wealth is not a sin. You know, we just have to be careful to be sure that we're seeing the right thing. My, my, uh, I have friends at West Huntsville who keep my computers going. They're techs, tech guys. They're, they know, they're brilliant, brilliant minds. And, and because of that, I don't have to learn that stuff. I rather like that. And so when my computer's not right, I just, you know, tell you. And what they'll say is now, uh, they'll fix it, you know. And they, they warn me sometimes, now, Glenn, and I don't do this. They just warn me about a lot of things, but I don't do this. But they say, now, you be careful about just opening anything, any email that comes to you, because sometimes there are viruses attached to those things. I don't, I don't do that. If I smell something funny, I just don't open it, because I know that's not smart. Well, let me tell you something. Money's like that. There's nothing wrong with money, but you better be careful because there, there are viruses in there, viruses of the heart. I think what we ought to do sometimes is teach our money a, a good lesson. You know how you do that? You're not my boss. I own you. You don't own me. You, you have to give it away. You, you know, when, when, you, when you contribute to the work of the Lord on the first day of the week in contribution, you're teaching your money a lesson. You hear what I'm saying? You're teaching, teaching that money a lesson. When you find a benevolent need that, that you can feel because you've got the money to do it and you do that, you give it away. You teach your money a lesson. I own you. Anyway, so with the layout of sins, you, you say, he, he says, you say, I am rich. Now, now, that's not a sin, but wait on it. Wait for it. I am increased with goods. I have become wealthy. Now, wait a minute. Is that wrong? No, no. I mean, you know, there's a thrill to business. Have you ever... Did you ever create some product, some service, something that, that is your brainchild and, and people are willing to pay money for it? There's a pleasure. There's a joy attached to business. I'm not a businessman, but I've been around it. And I tell you, there's a pleasure attached to that, so long as you're careful about the viruses. There's some pitfalls around there. You know how much money, how much money does a man want? Just one more dollar, right? One more dollar. So you've got to be careful about that. Uh, but, but wait for this now. That's not where the sin is. Not in I am rich, not in I am increased with goods, but here it is. Are you ready? And I have need of nothing. I don't know about you, but that makes me tremble. How, how you could verbalize, how you could let those words come out of your mouth. That's, these are Christians. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ who live in Laodicea and have need of nothing. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? Stop that. Stop it. A while back, I learned a new vocabulary word. I, I like that. Mrs. Colley and I, we, we travel a lot, and, and I don't care anything about the radio, but, but what I like is for her to read to me. So we read biographies, and we read fiction and nonfiction, and all sorts. There, we always, anytime you ask me, I can tell you, we've got a number of books waiting on it. One day when we leave to go to glory, we will have a collection of books that we intended to read that we want. All right. And, and I, I love that. And, but, but one of the things that I will do when she gets to a word as she's reading to me, and I don't know that word, I stop her. And wh wait a minute, I don't, wait a minute. What's that? What does that word mean? And, and if she doesn't know, she usually knows, but if she doesn't know, then, you know, we're going to stop and we're going to look that word up and we'll talk about that word, the etymology of the word and the, the definition of the word. And I, anyway, nihilism. Nihilism is an interesting word as it relates to the church at Laodicea. Nihilism is, is what happens in a culture when you combine prosperity with secularism. Prosperity with secularism produces nihilism. Nihilism is the idea that, that the moorings of traditional values are no longer important. <laughs> the values that we used to hold, that culture held in America, not so important. We're, we're more enlightened than that. 
And that's what the prosperity and secularism produces. It produces nihilism. And it produces exactly what the church at Laodicea is saying. Jesus said, you say, I'm rich and I'm increased with goods and I have need of nothing. Why did you say that? How can you say that? Is that that's insane. That's just wrong. It's so wrong. You've got to stop, stop that. You've got to get that out of your heart. You know what? We're at risk about this one. We're at risk about all these. You reckon nihilism is a threat to you and me? I think it was Tolstoy who, who talked about plucking a, a flower. And, and, you, and you've done this. We, we've all done this. You're a beautiful flower, and you're walking along somewhere, and you see a, a flower. What's happening in culture right now in America is nihilism. And, you, and, you, and it's like this. You go and you pluck that thing up, and you say, it's a beautiful flower. And you take it to the table, and you put it in a vase. And suppose the person who plucked it and put it in the vase reason this way. I, I should be able to keep this flower for, oh, a year or two, and I'll watch it grow, and it'll get bigger and beautiful, and every year maybe, you know, it'll reflower. What would you say to that person? Well, no, no, it's, that, that won't work, you see, because you've, you've disconnected that flower from its roots. What? Roots? You, that's the old way of thinking. People used to think that you had to have roots to make a flower beautiful, right? But that's, listen, we, we're, we're beyond that. That's not so important anymore. What I just described to you, of course, is absurdity, but that's exactly nihilism. That is the, and that is exactly the kind of thing that's eating us up in America right now, that we can be great without being good, that we can cut ourselves free from the, the values of the New Testament, the Bible values. Marriage can be great, even though we make it secular instead of biblical. What you just did is to cut it from the roots and it won't work. I am rich. I'm increased with goods. Wonderful. And then they said, and have need of nothing. Now that's a heart problem that'll kill you. He said, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. And here's the accurate picture. I've always thought it would be interesting to have a mirror. Wouldn't you like to have a mirror that, that would make you more better looking than you really are. What do you think? Wouldn't you love that mirror? Now, at first you might, but how long before, you, before it, it rather sickened you because you knew it wasn't accurate? My, my wife has a, uh, she's not here, so you mustn't tell her that I'm going to say this to you. She's one of those strange people. Now, I married her because she's different from me, just to let you know. But one of the things that she likes to do is to, is to set the clock in the car back five minutes or eight minutes. And you know, so and you say, well, honey, why do you do that? Well, because that, that sort of makes me think, I, you know, it makes me hurry a little more because it makes me think that I don't have as much time and then I, I'm more apt to be on time where I'm going. And it just, you know, I, my mind doesn't work like that. So what about, I mean, what, yeah, I'm, I'm just strange to think that I, a clock ought to, ought to be, well, accurate. But so how long could you enjoy a clock like that if you knew that it was deliberately wrong in order to play with your, and you would say, no, I don't think so, no. I need it to say what it says. So here you have the church at Laodicea, and here's what they say. We're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And here's the reality. Maybe it felt good. Got the money. Got the money. You're wretched. You're miserable. You're poor. You're blind. You're naked. You better buy of me gold. You better buy my gold. I love that. Uh, what, about, what about the gold? You got the gold? I don't care how much money you've got in your bank account right now. I'm asking you this question. This is more important. Do you have the gold, the gold of Jesus Christ? Now, what I'm challenging, and I know my time's up, what I'm challenging is this. We're talking about Servants' Day, and we're talking about matters of the heart. Here we learn lessons about human beings from churches of Christ a couple of thousand years ago. Now, all these people are, are dead and gone. They've been, their bodies have been slumbering in the grave, and they're in a place of bliss or a place of torment. Every one of them have been for these 2,000 years. And yet the lessons are as fresh as, as today. Worship as if 
you're singing praise to the one with whom you will live for all eternity. Pray through the one who died on the cross for you without whom you would go to hell. Sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. If you let your Christianity degenerate down to merely an intellectual activity, then you lose. When our Lord was speaking to Sardis in chapter 3, he says, you know, you got the heart thing wrong, but you can come back. I'm, I'm so very grateful for that. I, I urge all of us to self-examine and to refocus and to make sure that my heart, my passion about my Christianity and my Lord is where it should be. I'm so glad you're here. God bless you.